So allogeneic stem cell transplant uh, is the only transplant uh, until now that has curative potential in MDS. So every MDS patient who is a suitable candidate should have at least have a, stem, a transplant evaluation at a, at a stem cell transplant center. Um, there are various factors that are considered when you uh, decide to go ahead with transplantation. One obviously is the risk of the uh, risk uh, category of the patient. How likely is this patient uh, going to transform into AML? For example, the low and intermediate one risk patients, uh, the uh, practice is to wait and transplant them when they have disease progression. That's because there is a significant amount of non-relapse mortality associated with transplant. And MDS patients have, uh, they are older patients and they have significant comorbidities, which will have to be considered when you make that decision. The availability of donor is another uh, consideration. How closely matched uh, is the donor that is available? And so all of these factors, patient comorbidity, the donor availability, uh, the risk of the patient, all of this will have to be considered when you make that decision to uh, move forward with transplant. Um, age by itself is not an absolute uh, criteria. Um, there are patients who may be in their 70s who may be appropriate candidates, although um, as you get older, the outcomes of transplant are worse. Stem cell transplantation is the only potentially curative therapy for MDS, but of course it has a high morbidity and transplant-related mortality. And like everything we do in medicine, we want to weigh the potential risks against the potential benefits. So a number of factors are taken into account when assessing a patient's eligibility for stem cell transplantation, including age, donor status, performance status, comorbidities, and so on. Uh, so that uh, depending on these factors, uh, we, uh, the patient may or may not be a candidate for stem cell transplantation. In MDS, lower risk patients may have a good quality of life for long periods of time before they progress to higher risk MDS. And so doing a stem cell transplant up front may not be in their interests. In higher risk patients, however, they do have a high mortality and so doing a stem cell transplant earlier is probably better. This has been demonstrated in a decision analysis by Corey Cutler and colleagues, uh, not only the original decision analysis in the days of the IPSS, but also a more recent one in the days of some of the newer treatments for MDS. Iron overload, the degree of iron overload is an important consideration in patients who are uh, proceeding to stem cell transplantation. Various studies, uh, mostly retrospective, have shown that uh, patients who come into transplant with uh, high levels of body iron uh, do have a poor outcome uh, from a variety of different reasons, of uh, causes. Um, the approach to a patient who is proceeding to transplant, uh, the first and foremost is to prevent iron overload by monitoring that patient and using chelation appropriately. And this is particularly um, an issue with the lower risk patients who may be seen, um, who may be uh, transfusion dependent for a while before they proceed to transplant. Um, unfortunately, the chelators will take um, some time to bring the body iron burden down. So very often when patients are seen at a transplant center, they are in need for immediate transplant and uh, there is not enough time to uh, chelate them. But in a patient whose risk of transformation is low and a transplant is needed, uh, one can chelate the patient adequately before proceeding to transplant. One example would be a lower risk patient who is transfusion dependent and needs a stem cell transplant. In high risk patients, um, it's not often possible to chelate them prior to transplant. We do know that uh, the non-transfer inbound iron in the plasma rises during transplantation and that is implicated in many of the complications of stem cell transplant but we don't have a, uh, a good um, treatment for that during transplant so we will have to deal with the iron overload after they are done with the transplant but we can be careful during transplantation we know that iron overloaded patients have certain risks particularly risks for complications like infections we know occlusive disease so it allows us to uh, to be aware of these risks and manage those patients appropriately. Management of iron overload after transplant is um, 
there are no good studies which compare different approaches. Basically, there are two uh, ways you can deal with it. One is by phlebotomy. The other one is using pharmacologic um, approach, which is ion chelation. Uh, in patients who have a good graft function, they have normal hemoglobin after transplant, um, you can phlebotomize those patients. If the venous axis is good, uh, they can be phlebotomized and you can bring iron burden down that way. It is not clear if pharmacologic chelation is better than phlebotomy. Um, it is easier in some ways uh, for the patient, but um, the oral ion chelators uh, most often used is dif diferacidox, which has some uh, side effects which may make it difficult to administer it in the post-transplant period. Uh, for example, the gastrointestinal toxicity of the drug or the renal toxicity of the drug may be a problem when it's given with some of the other medications that are given after transplantation. So um, the, these two approaches uh, are possible after transplant, either phlebotomy or by uh, or ion chelation uh, using diferacidox. And there is no definite uh, answer for that. It's uh, there are a lot of factors are considered before we make that decision. Managing iron overload after transplantation, I think, is much of an easier management. Uh, situation than before or during transplant. And we have two options for iron reduction post stem cell transplant. For patients who have uh, no transfusion requirement post transplant and uh, who have a relatively normal hemoglobin, phlebotomy intermittently may be a good option for reducing iron overload over time. For other patients, iron chelation therapy uh, may be warranted. For example, if they're not yet transfusion independent, haven't fully engrafted. Um, with iron chelation therapy, we do get a suppression of labile plasma iron, so theoretically it may be better than intermittent phlebotomy, but I think this still needs to be demonstrated by clinical trials.